Welcome to this episode of The Common Sense Skeptic. As much as science fiction has encouraged many young people to enter the STEM fields to contribute to our space programs, it has at the same time done a tremendous disservice to its viewers as a whole by ignoring or dismissing the subject of artificial gravity. Almost every TV show and movie set in space has travelers walking normally on deckheads, just as they would on Earth. And now generations of Trekkies and Cylon fanboys expect that that's how space will be. Normal gravity and breathable air on every ship and every Class M planet. In past videos, we have covered several aspects of interplanetary travel with regards to the lack of gravity aboard space vessels. The effects microgravity will have on a human body and the challenges those conditions present with regards to bringing livestock to Mars as two examples. Many people don't realize that without gravity, certain aspects of space colonization are next to impossible to pull off. Birds, for example, cannot drink water in an environment with no gravity. They do not possess throat muscles required for peristalsis, and they must raise their head to allow water and food to go down their throat. When presented with facts such as this, diehard believers simply posit that artificial gravity will somehow magically be provided, making all of these very serious issues go away. Artificial rotational gravity is often specifically mentioned, because these people believe that will be easiest to achieve, if anyone ever starts working on it. If it was easy to achieve, there would be rotational space stations in orbit now, since they have been a concept for consideration for over 100 years. Konstantin Tsiolkovsky wrote about using rotation to create artificial gravity in space as early as 1903. Werner von Braun, with help from Walt Disney, produced TV segments in the 1950s outlining donut-shaped space station designs, but to date there have been no rotating stations placed in orbit to prove this is possible or to collect the data on whether or not a rotating station in orbit can provide a suitable replacement to gravity on Earth. In fact, the only large-scale rotating addition ever planned for the ISS, the $100 million Nautilus X, was cancelled. It is not sufficient that an orbiting structure simply spin and has to spin a certain way, at a certain speed, and with a large enough radius to keep people pressed against the outside walls. Physicists know, in theory, what types of fictional forces are required to create gravity in space, and they have formulas that can tell us how big a structure has to be, and how slowly it has to spin, before intersecting physical effects on the body are mitigated. Those forces are tidal effects, which are a significantly different gravity affecting opposite ends of the body, caused when the radius of the rotating structure is too small compared to the height of the person. The Coriolis effect, which is a pattern of deflection taken by objects not firmly connected to the ground or floor, caused by moving along the floor with, against, or sideways to the rotation. Tipping effects, likened to climbing up a ladder while it is being flipped end over end. This is caused when a person moves closer to the rotational center of a system and canal sickness, which is variances in your inner ear semicircular canals that causes dizziness, nausea, and even blackouts. It is caused when the rate of rotation exceeds the inner ear's ability to cope with the displacement. In this episode, we are going to animate various proposed structures to demonstrate the rate of rotation required and compare Martian gravity, around 0.32 g, to the 1 g on Earth. In each of them, the closer the figure gets to the red dot, indicating the approximate center of gravity or Barry center, the less fictional forces they will feel pulling on them. At the red dot, there will be no forces at all. Just as a quick disclaimer, some of these spinning objects on the screen may cause a little bit of dizziness. According to experts, the ideal scenario is for a large rotating structure such as DS9 with a radius of 895 meters rotating at 1 RPM causing 1 G of gravitational force at the outside edge. This closely mimics gravity on Earth. Or so they think, since there have never been any experiments of this nature in regards to space, it's still anybody's guess whether or not this would be a comfortable or disorienting situation for an average person, how long it would take to adjust, or if that's even possible. Also on this diagram, because the inner ring of the structure has a shorter radius and a smaller circumference, one RPM would result in only 0.36 G, or roughly what Martian explorers would expect upon arrival. Throughout the station, visitors would encounter differing levels of gravity, dropping to zero at the rotational center. There are a number of channels on YouTube with animations of Starship in various configurations that the producers believe would cause suitable artificial gravity. We're going to go through some of them and demonstrate why, for the most part, these concepts have little to no chance of success. Let's start off with this animation from Manimus11 on YouTube. This clever clip extends an arm away from Starship with a counterweight 
to give the craft a wider profile, thinking that the arm extension extends the radius of the vehicle. Unfortunately, as you can see, the rotational axis of this example still runs right down the center of the ship. As a result, the fictional forces being produced would send astronauts to the outside walls of the craft, which is definitely not ideal. These figures are to scale with a ship's radius of 4.5 meters. To mimic Martian levels of gravity, this vehicle must rotate almost 9 times per minute. Now, remember the tidal forces? Look at the difference between the gravity affecting their feet versus what they are experiencing in their head, where the inner ear is located. This is a significant enough difference that simply touching their toes and standing back up could cause them to become dizzy and disoriented. To achieve Earth's 1G of gravity, those rotations need to be bumped up to around 15 RPM, or one revolution every four seconds, making the tidal forces even greater. Now, if those speeds don't look terribly different to you, here's what they look like when they're overlaid. Here's another illustration of how extreme this rate of rotation would be. Concentrate on the center of this image. At 15 RPM, this is what the view looking forward of Starship would look like through the atrium windows, and it would look like that for the entire trip. If you think this wouldn't cause you to become extremely disoriented to the point of nausea and blackouts, consider this. This is what the star field looks like after it stops moving. Chances are pretty good that right now portions of that image are still churning on you, and that's just the tricks that it's going to play with your eyes. On the chart depicting a typical comfort zone, this system falls into this area of discomfort. The next proposal is one we found on Reddit, where the author proposes to tumble the starship end over end to create gravity. In this case, the rotational center is in the middle of the craft, but the axes would extend across the ship, giving the rotation a radius of up to 25 meters. This would force travelers' feet towards the respective end of the ship. Unfortunately, this would cause persons in the living or payload compartment to have to walk on the ceiling and on the walls in the direction of the forward motion with little gravity at all at the center of the vessel. The same would be true if there were two starships made it aft to aft. The varying degrees of gravity being encountered throughout the ship would again be extremely disorienting, resulting in physical and mental discomfort. In this scenario, this is the rate of rotation required to achieve Martian gravity. This is the rate of rotation required for Earth gravity. And this is what the two rates look like when they're overlaid. Far too fast for people to function normally. And on this chart of discomforts, this is where this system falls. Other proposals we have seen include attaching several starships to a central circular truss such as this, then directing the complete structure forward towards Mars somehow. But once again, this configuration would have travelers walking on the outside walls of the vehicle, with the opposite wall being the ceiling of the space. This is the first concept where the rotational center is outside the craft, and in this particular example, it would actually be located in the middle of a central void. If both sides of the system are not exactly the same weight, that center of gravity will not be stationary, and that will cause the entire structure to wobble. With this radius, the rate of rotation for Martian gravity would look like this. The rate of rotation for Earth gravity would look like this. And the two rotational rates overlaid would look like this. And here is where that system lands on our graph of discomforts. The only way to rotate spacecraft so that travelers will be able to walk on the floor, as the ship must be designed for, is by rotating it from its nose with the aft end away from the rotational center. Why must the ship be designed this way? Well, when the vehicle is landed on the moon or Mars, it will be the primary habitat for travelers on the surface. There's no way around that. Every animation, artist concept, and napkin drawing about Starship on Mars has it standing upright on that skinny little base it has. The deckheads are the floors, plain and simple, so if the ship is going to experience gravity en route, this is how it should experience it. There are at least two concepts out there, both of which rely heavily on the Gemini 11 gravity tether experiment to validate themselves. In September of 1966, the Gemini 11 module released a counterweight vehicle called Agena, and while the two were connected by a 30 meter tether, the vehicles tried to swing around each other to create artificial gravity. As you can see in NASA's photos, the tether was not kept taut when it was rolled out, nor could it be kept taut without firing the side thrusters, and the sum total of gravity they were able to achieve was 0.00015g. 
In comparison to gravity on Earth, if gravity was a particle, that would come in at about 150 parts per million, which likely falls inside the realm of statistical anomaly. This system also had no object at the rotational center to stabilize against, nothing from which to extend out from on both sides to ensure a stabilized rotation. Here's the biggest issue surrounding the use of such a tether. First, gravity is caused by pulling against the other object, and once that happens in a vacuum, if the other object isn't fastened in place, it will just be pulled along. This creates slack in the system, which must be taken up. And the only way to do that with rockets in space is with thrusters. So both vehicles, while spinning around each other, will have to constantly be running their control thrusters to pull against the other craft. Starship is already way short on payload capacity, so extra fuel tanks needed to burn thrusters for the entire trip are unlikely. That, and if either vehicle's thruster fails, this system instantly becomes destabilized and useless. Here's one way to illustrate that. There is an Olympic sport that demonstrates the interaction between two bodies held together by a tether, dating back to 1829 BC, known as the hammer throw, which originated in the Scottish Highlands. The object of this sport is to spin around in a tight circle while holding onto a hammer at the other end of a pole or a cable. Once the athlete has the hammer rotating around them quickly enough, they release their end of the cable and they send the hammer flying downfield as far as possible. The rotational center of this system is through the vertical center of the athlete, who must plant their feet and retain traction on the surface while providing the rotational force required to get the hammer in motion. If the athlete loses their footing or if the cable snaps, the much smaller hammer can send the athlete flying. A 16 pound or 7.26 kilo ball at the end of a 4 foot or 121 centimeter cable moving around the athlete at 65 miles per hour or 29 meters per second requires a cable capable of taking 770 pounds or 350 kilograms of tension. The hammer can be flung like this around the athlete because the athlete has solid contact with the ground. The rotational axis of this system is through the center of the athlete. The hammer is spinning around the athlete, but the athlete hardly changes position at all. In the proposed tether system between spacecraft, neither craft is secured in place, so the rotational center would be a shifting and massless point somewhere along the tether, referred to as the Berry Center, against which both satellites would be pulling. Another aspect of such a system that needs mentioning is how would it perform course corrections, or avoid objects. Once the vector is chosen, it seems unlikely to be able to be altered for any reason while the ships are in this configuration. And how would you get forward motion in this system at all? There's another proposal video on YouTube by a channel called Small Stars that tries to address several failings in the tether system, this time by using a truss network between the crafts extended from yet another starship in between the two. This central vehicle would extend a truss outwards to both the other ships and give the system a rotational center within the vehicle. The three ships would interlink, start moving towards Mars by angling the outside ships on their mounts, adjust again to spin up to a second configuration, then once it's moving forward, rotate again into a configuration where the noses of the rotating ships are facing the truss vehicle. This would allow travelers to walk on their floor, after being bounced around quite a bit with all the different changes in orientation. This system accounts for several shortcomings in the tether system. There is no requirement for continuous thrusters to keep a connecting line tight, it has a rotational center located within a powered vehicle, and it would require both outside vehicles to be exactly the same weight. The proposed radius of the trussing system, measuring to the airlock deck, is 100 meters. The yoke at each end would add about another 50 meters to the total, so we're looking at using about 300 meters of trussing with a gauge sturdy enough to hold on to a fully loaded starship while spinning at 31.5 meters per second at the airlock deck and 41 meters per second at the tail. For reference, going back to the hammer throw, that 7.26 kilo ball is moving at about 26 meters per second and the cable is required to hold 350 kilos of tension without snapping. Judging the measurement of the truss in relation to the width of the Starship, this model is using a box-type truss with approximately 1.75 meters width. With a payload capacity of 100 tons, requiring 300 meters of truss means that the absolute maximum weight of these members would be 300 kilos per meter, or 75 kilograms per face of the box truss. Let's compare that to the type of trussing used by the entertainment industry. This lightweight aluminum alloy truss found on Alibaba weighs 7.51 kilos per meter and measures 29 centimeters across. To make the 1.75 meter width and height, multiply this weight by approximately 36, and that gives a weight of 270 kilos per meter. 
steel in comparison to this aluminum is 2.5 times as dense, so the same structure made in steel would weigh 675 kilograms per meter. Steel is much stronger than aluminum and is more likely to be able to hold on to the rotating vehicles at the far end of the truss, but it also blows way past the 300 kilograms per meter limitation. These aluminum examples are lightweight trusses meant for handling theatrical lights and flying speakers over concert venues. If the gauge required to secure the Starship needs to be increased whatsoever, the central vehicle will be exceeding its payload capacity, and that's without considering connections or assembly machinery or power supplies or spare parts. So a simple light gauge aluminum lighting truss with those dimensions pretty much maxes out the mass this vehicle can lift, and the same structure in steel would require a doubling of the payload capacity. In short, the central vehicle at the center of this proposal will not be capable of lifting this amount of truss to orbit. In a chart depicting a typical comfort zone, this system falls into this area of discomfort. Now here's something for the Kerbal crowd. Although we don't use the program for modeling, perhaps this is a simulation you could work out for us and report your findings. Send us the video link, we'll be happy to post it for you. Here's the scenario. Whether connected by tether or by trussing, as a rotating system is headed towards Mars, it's completely possible that all of a sudden, the connecting structure snaps. Both ships would be flung away from their trajectory. They will both tumble, having instantly lost gravity, possibly on all three axes depending on how quickly the break occurred. One scenario where the trussing might snap is during a course correction, where the central vehicle has to do a correction burn, causing flex on the trussing to the point where it eventually snaps at any one of the potential points of failure along the length. And if that happens, it would be nice to know the odds of being able to recover the ship and if there is a point of no return on that scenario. General havoc would break out on the ship, as everything and everyone on the ship would be instantly subjected to weightlessness. It would be up to the bridge crew to stabilize the ship and try to bring it back in line with their approach vector. The question is, how quickly could they recover, and how much fuel would it take to get the ship back on course, and would it still even have enough fuel on board to not only perform this maneuver, but still conduct its landing procedure? It would be interesting to see if the situation faced by the crew and guests aboard the fictional Avenue 5 starship that caused it to be lost in space is based on actual astrophysics, because the variance they suffered was minimal, but the effect was extreme. The biggest problem people seem to have when thinking about artificial gravity is thinking that anything that rotates has gravity without putting any thought into which way those forces go, how big the structures need to be, and how fast they have to spin. Maybe now, after these demonstrations, everyone can be a little bit more grounded when they're talking about artificial gravity. Thanks for watching this episode of The Common Sense Skeptic. During production of this episode, NASA and ULA successfully landed Perseverance on Mars landing it in the Jezero Crater. Hopefully you had an opportunity to check out that NASA live stream and some of the 4K images that Percy has now transmitted from the surface of Mars. Due to repeated suggestions, we are now live on Twitter at C underscore S underscore Skeptic. And you can also check us out on Instagram and support our episodes directly through Patreon at patreon.com backslash the common sense skeptic. You can also support our efforts by liking and sharing our videos and by hitting that subscribe button so you'll know when the Common Sense Skeptic returns.